Okay, so welcome everyone to the first talk. Uh, for our first speaker, we have Eric Guinoua from the Weizmann Institute, who is an expert on computational complexity in general and PCP theorems in particular, and she will be delivering the introductory lecture of our PCP mini course. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'll be shutting off my camera. I just wanted to say hi, uh, at least so you can see me, but I have some Wi-Fi issues. So I'm gonna leave the meeting and from my Mac and just remain on my iPad. Uh, okay. All right. So uh, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, So we have a sequence of four uh, lectures, crash course on PCPs. And I'll start with the first lecture, which will be very introductory, uh, kind of setting up uh, uh, what PCPs are and the context, hardness of approximation, and going into parallel repetition. Our, uh, the way we designed the, the four lectures with Dana Moshkovitz, the first uh, two lectures are more introductory and the second two are more um, a kind of designed to be, to describe areas that touch as much as we uh, see on uh, topics of high dimensional geometry that might be interesting for the specific uh, program that we are taking part of. Um, so there are many geometrical questions. Uh, the lectures on Friday and Monday will be touching more on these kinds of aspects. Today will be more introductory. Okay. Um, so let me start by describing a a three coloring, which is an NP problem. Now, I'm not uh, assuming people have a, a strong complexity background and I, I'm not interested in giving a complexity definition. So the best way I've found uh, to describe the PCP theorem is to give a more a concrete example. For example, three coloring. So what is three coloring? We have a, a graph. A, vertices and edges. So the graph can look something like this. Um, maybe these are the edges. Uh, this is a graph. And it's uh, three, a three coloring is a, just a, a coloring of the vertices a, in three colors. So a, a three coloring is some string C in 0, 1, 2, these are the colors, raised to the power of V. So every vertex receives a color. And the coloring is uh, considered to be a legal coloring if uh, C is valid, if for every edge, UV, uh, C of U is different from C of V. So every edge sees two distinct colors. Okay, so let's see if this graph is uh, three colorable. So I can color this vertex red, and then I can color this one blue, and then I can color maybe this one orange, and I can keep going like this. So this one can be red, maybe this one will be blue, this one red. And then I reach this last vertex and I see that it has three neighbors. One is red, one is orange, and one is blue. So I cannot, there is no way I can uh, color this vertex uh, uh, properly. If I, if I choose to color it red, for example, then uh, this edge will be uh, okay. Wait, how do I do this? This edge will be bichromatic. This edge will be seeing two different colors, but this edge will be uh, red and red. Okay, so this graph is actually not uh, so this graph is not three colorable, but there is something interesting about this graph. 
notice that the number of, I had one vertex in the middle and there were an odd number of vertices around uh, that were all connected by a cycle. So really the, this graph is supposed to hint at a graph that is a cycle of, of a odd length, of growing length. And all the vertices in the cycle are connected to a central vertex. This, this such a graph is almost three colorable. It's not three colorable for the same reason that this example is not, but there is a three coloring which I just drew, which violates only one single edge. So in some sense, you can say, oh, it's almost three colorable because there is a coloring that satisfies almost all of the validity constraints. Every edge is happy except for this one unhappy edge. Okay, and this is kind of uh, demonstrating some uh, important aspect of a constraint satisfaction problems, uh, which we will now discuss. Okay, but before we discuss them, I just want to say that what we, what we are seeing here is a, a combinatorial problem, three coloring. Uh, and I described it as, you know, every edge needs to see the two different colors, but of course you can view it as a special case of uh, what we call a CSP, a constraint satisfaction problem. Where we are looking at assignments to some variables. Here, the variables are on the vertices and the assignment is supposed to give the variables colors. And we have a bunch of constraints. Here, every edge poses a constraint and the constraint says, this color should be different from that color. So these are inequality constraints. But in general, CSPs uh, can have more, uh, there's a huge variety of uh, problems that fall into this uh, general notion of constraint satisfaction problem. Okay, for example, uh, the constraints can be uh, DNF clauses, Boolean clauses, like in FreeSAT. They can be CNF clauses, they can be um, linear equations over some finite field. Um, so there are many, many different uh, examples of constraint satisfaction problems. And for all of them, whatever I'm going to say is relevant. So let me tell you a couple of examples of CSPs. Uh, one is uh, 3SAT. So 3SAT, we're all very familiar, right? You, you have some variables like X1 or not X2 or X7. This is one constraint. And then we have many more like this. Okay, so this is a constraint satisfaction problem. And maybe another kind of constraint satisfaction problem is 3LIN where the constraints are of the form X1 plus X3 plus X4 equals one mod two. So these are linear equations and maybe you'll have another one. And this is another kind of constraint satisfaction problem. Uh, so these are uh, all problems that are uh, problems in NP in the sense that um, if you give me a solution to, to one of these problems, it's easy for me to check them. Uh, so let me uh, say that, I forgot to say it about three coloring. So three coloring and similarly all CSPs is in NP, which means that if you give me a coloring to the graph, if you tell me every vertex what color it is, it's very easy for me to go edge by edge and check that this coloring is proper, is valid. So there's a polynomial time algorithm for checking that the coloring is okay. But if you ask me to uh, find the coloring, you give me a graph and you ask me can you please give me a coloring, a three coloring of this graph? Then uh, we don't know of a way to do it. And it's believed to be impossible. If you manage to find the way to do it, this would prove that P equals NP. This problem is not only in NP, it's actually NP hard. 
And the meaning of this is that um, any, other, any other problem in NP can be encoded or recast uh, into this problem. Meaning that if someone found an algorithm for finding a three coloring of a graph, of an arbitrary graph, then immediately you, you can use that to solve any other problem in, in NP. So that's the meaning of being NP hard here. And so we saw this example of this graph. If you look at this graph, it's not so hard to convince yourself that it's not three colorable and to uh, prove it to yourself. But when we say the three coloring is NP hard, it means that generally when we get a graph of uh, a large number of vertices, there is no efficient way for us to decide if it is or it isn't uh, three colorable. So uh, it's, it's like, it's, the graph is out there in the open, but the answer whether it's three colorable or not is totally hidden. And if you think about the, a given graph, for example, look at the graph that I drew here. Uh, the set of colorings, it's, you can think of it as some geometric set, 0, 1, 2 to the power of V. So it's a set of strings. Okay, and every string you can attach to it the number of edges that it violates. Okay, so you have some kind of a landscape where for every point in the space, there is some energy value which says how many constraints are being violated. And if a graph is three colorable or not, it's just whether or not there is a point that has zero violations somewhere. Right? And the way um, a graph defines this uh, set of uh, valid strings in an implicit way by a set of uh, equations. So NP sets are always this kind of uh, sets. They are always defined implicitly by a set of equations. And we are trying to see, for example, the uh, question of a graph up, being three color or not. It doesn't appear to be moving. Like, at least uh, for me, it's frozen on the, uh, on, at the very beginning with the graph of, with the picture of the three coloring graph. Ah, okay. Yeah, moves. yeah, yeah. I think this is how I put it. Because I, I was just trying to, thanks for ah, asking. Okay. At least I know someone is out there because I'm, okay. I'm not seeing you guys. So uh, please do interrupt me. And I'm just talking about, I, I was, putting this on the screen because I wanted to have a graph in mind. Okay, got so it, sorry I, to interrupt. Maybe I should do this so you know I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Mm. Okay, so um, to, fi to finish just this, this uh, short introduction to uh, constraint satisfaction problems, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, but as a bootcamp, I, I found it necessary to define this. Uh, when I think of the set 0, 1, 2 uh, raised to the power of V, it's a set of strings, and I can think of two different measures on it. One measure is just, if you look at two strings, I can measure their distance on how many vertices do they agree. So maybe I start with some coloring and I flip one color, I get to another coloring, okay? So they're very close to each other. They're only one vertex apart. That's one kind of uh, measure on colorings. And another one is the measure of how many edges are being violated, okay? And sometimes uh, you get a graph and you find a coloring that's almost a three coloring. For example, the coloring we have here satisfies almost all of the edges except for one. So you might uh, kind of naively expect that, oh, okay, if I can al already almost satisfy all the constraints, then I can probably just play a little bit and maybe flip one of the colors and change it a little bit and I will get a perfect coloring. But in this example, you see how brittle it is. You can satisfy almost all of the edges, but there is no way to satisfy all of the edges. So, so a lot of uh, graphs and a lot of CSP instances have this property that they're very uh, brittle in this way. Satisfiability, you, you seem as if you're approaching it, but you're really not. Um, however, uh, in the kind of instances that the PCP theorem generates, this is not the case. Uh, 
the PCP theorem uh, tells you that actually not only is three coloring NP hard, but actually uh, there is a mapping that takes, uh, for example, three coloring, but it can take any other NP language into a set of instances that have this uh, robustness property. So let me tell you what I mean here. This is still uh, I, probably quite vague and I will soon become more formal. The PCP theorem is an algorithm. We call it a reduction, okay? It's a reduction algorithm that uh, maps a, a graph G to another graph, let's call it PCP of G, all right, denoted by G tilde, okay? And it's a, it's a polynomial time algorithm. It takes the in, initial graph and outputs another graph. And it has this special property that if G was three colorable, then also the, the new graph will be three colorable. And if G is not, then the new graph, not only it's, it's not three colorable like in our example, but actually it's very far from three colorable. Okay, it's a uh, far in what in what distance? In the sense that no matter how you three color it, many like one percent fraction of the edges will be unhappy. We'll see the same color on both endpoints. Okay, so G is far from three colorable. Namely, let me call it that the value of G tilde is less than 0.99, where what is the value of a graph? It's the maximal fraction of valid uh, edges. When I, instead of valid, let me write bichromatic. Bichromatic. So when I say maximal fraction, I mean overall, overall assigns. Not, not, not assignments, overall colorings. Okay, so if you give me a graph, I can ask if it's three colorable or not, but I can ask even something uh, more refined, which is, okay, over all the possible ways I can three color this graph, every three coloring violates some fraction of edges, and I want the one that violates the fewest, or in other words, satisfies the most edges and this is the value of g tilde so this theorem just tells me oh you know it could be that initially if i look at all possible graphs some of them are even though they're not three color well they're very close to this they they can be very misleading uh, they, they can be uh, like in my example they can have a coloring that's almost uh, it satisfies all the edges except for one so these are like these brittle graphs that uh, will confuse me the PCP theorem tells me, oh, but there's a polynomial time algorithm that takes your graph and changes it uh, in a way that now the output is guaranteed to have this property that if initially you were in a non three colorable uh, situation, then now you're in a very strongly non three colorable situation. Okay, so that's all uh, good and well. Now, why would I care about this kind of transformation? So, uh, this leads me back to kind of the way the PCP theorem was conceived and formulated and, and proven initially. This was a, a line of proof that started in the late 80s and uh, came from crypto. And let me call it uh, uh, the dramatized, dramatized, I don't know if this is a good name or not, a perspective on PCPs. Okay, so so far Irit, the perspective um, I gave. Irit, there's yes. a question in the Q&A that might be good live. At, uh, the question asks that uh, does 0.99 depend on the graph G? Oh, okay, great. So thanks for the question. So there was a 0.99 here. Uh, 9 does not depend on the graph G. Thanks, so uh, the, the way this theorem should read is an algorithm and with the algorithm comes the number 0.99. It's a guarantee of the algorithm. So that for every graph, 
you g you get g tilde and you have this property okay so uh, that's actually the strength of the theorem that uh, g can grow the number of vertices can go to infinity but there is still one percent of the edges that will always cry out uh, you know i'm i'm seeing the same color on both endpoints um, where whereas without the pcp theorem there, there's always going to be one edge that cries out, but as a percentage, it will be a negligible percent of the edges when, when the graph goes to infinity. Does this answer the question? Well, the person who asked the question isn't able to, uh, to speak, but uh, I think so. Uh, yes, we also definitely. Have... Yeah, I mean, I, I just interjected because I thought it might be a good question other people might have too. Thanks, Arit. Certainly, I can't see the questions, unfortunately. So thanks for, uh, yeah, calling them so, out. Please. So we have continue. some more questions in the chat, some of which Dana has already uh, answered on the chat, but, uh, but you can answer them also if you like. Uh, so someone asked how much bigger may G tilde be than G? Um, and whether 0.99 can okay, be replaced so by any constant smaller than one. Okay, so how much bigger may Right, so these are excellent questions and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna get back to them soon. Okay, but first we're gonna do a interlude to the dramatized perspective on PCPs, okay? Uh, and we'll get to these questions, so I, I won't forget. Okay, so, uh, so far we talked about uh, graphs or maybe system of constraints and their solutions and how many uh, constraints are being violated or not violated. So this is kind of a mathematical or a static view. Now there is a different way to view these things, which is a more a per personified or dramatized uh, perspective, which is a more natural. It, sometimes uh, this perspective is very useful. It, uh, people use it a lot in, in different areas and in TCS, it's been very useful, specifically in crypto. So you have entities, like you have maybe a prover and you think of this as like a person, right? And you have a verifier. Uh, and when people talk about them, they say, you know, the prover thinks this and that, but the verifier doesn't want the prover to cheat. So it's all very dramatic and they interact. And so these guys, they interact with each other. Sometimes there's more than one prover. And also maybe the verifier has some randomness. And those of you who haven't uh, heard a lot of crypto courses maybe don't know, but this was like a hugely new thing uh, in the 80s where these kinds of things were explored more uh, rigorously and formulated. And this led to uh, so many beautiful things. Actually, I'm sure that everyone has heard about this, but uh, nevertheless, uh, one of the things that uh, turned out is that indeed when the verifier has randomness, then the kind of the interaction between the verifier and the prover can, can become much more interesting and surprising in, 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 its, in the power that the verifier has. Okay, so let's, uh, let's return and see what uh, NP looks like in a dramatized perspective. So the prover is pretty static. The prover just writes the proof and goes away. So instead of a prover, really what you have is a proof. So we start with a verifier. I have that didn't work. Okay, so here is my verifier. And the verifier is always like an algorithm. It's, uh, computationally, it's, uh, it's supposed to be efficient, like an algorithm. And the verifier receives an input, for example, a graph, uh, you know, that it needs to decide if it's three colorable or not. Okay. It, and the verifier also has access to a proof. Okay, so here is the proof. No, it's disappearing. Here is the proof. Okay. So the prover wrote down the proof and left the room and the verifier can read the proof. So in an NP, in an NP, in an NP language or problem, uh, the this picture is supposed to describe the following situation. First thing, the verifier reads the input. Verifier reads input. And think of the input as some uh, graph uh, G, okay? So it's a graph G that the verifier needs to decide if it's three colorable or not. 
Okay, then uh, the verifier uh, reads the proof. So in our case, if it's a three colorable, if it's three coloring, then the proof can be, for example, a string in zero, one, two to the V. So it's just a coloring of the vertices. So think of this as a string where every symbol here is just a color. This is one, this is two, this is zero, this is zero. And these are just the colors of all the vertices. This can be a proof. Okay, and then the verifier decides, uh, it decides if to accept or reject. So it computes and it says uh, yes or no. Output, yes or no. So this is the output, yes or no. Okay, and in an NP, in an NP language, the property is that uh, if uh, G is three colorable, then there exists some proof pi such that the, maybe I don't have enough space here. So let me actually uh, do, it, uh, do it like this. Make everything smaller. Okay. So there exists a proof pi. Maybe I write here the word proof. Such that the verifier says yes. Okay. If of course there is, right? The proof would just be a three, a proper three coloring of the vertices, and the verifier. Uh, how does the verifier decide if to decide if to output yes or no? The verifier just goes edge by edge and checks that the endpoints of, of each edge are different colors. If yes, it will say yes. And if G is not three colorable, then for every proof, so no matter how you give me a coloring of the vertices, so it's for every proof, the verifier says no. Because there will always be some edge where it sees that the two endpoints are the same color. This is just in this example of three coloring, but as I told you, uh, this problem is NP complete, so it encodes any other NP language. So I'm not losing any generality by just talking about this seemingly very specific problem. Now, what is the PCP version of this interaction? So we said that there is randomness, right? So we add to this picture this, uh, we denote, we sometimes draw it by a random coin. So people like to put a dollar for the randomness and you add some randomness to the verifier. So the verifier doesn't just do everything deterministically but rather it has some a randomness, okay? So the verifier reads the input. Then here it's step 1.5, it uh, tosses some random bits. The number of random bits is actually, this is important. It should be logarithmic in the size of the input. So in our case, if we have a graph of size something n, let me denote it by n. So logarithmic in n, where n is the input size. Okay, so it tosses some random bits. And then um, it, it doesn't have to read the proof, all of the proof anymore. This is what initially was so amazing. Uh, actually, the verifier reads only part of the proof. Part. Maybe I should, I'm writing too small now, uh, part of the proof, okay? Um, so it can decide to maybe only read this part of the proof. Or maybe if the random string said something else, it would read this part of the proof. So really what's the, ver the verifier is doing, you should think of it as a distribution over many, many different uh, verifiers, depending on the random bits, right? So it's really a distribution. It's a, this randomized uh, verifier is a distribution over different uh, uh, kind of different ways the, the coin tosses fell. Okay, and for each different uh, coin toss, the verifier ends up deciding yes or no. So in the end, I need to think about the probability that the verifier said yes and the probability that it said no. So now if I go to, to, uh, to this, uh, these conditions, previously we said if G is three colorable, there exists a proof, there exists a proof by such that the verifier says yes. Now I cannot anymore say something like verifier says yes because the verifier is 
probabilistic. So instead, I, I write uh, the probability that the verifier says yes is one. Okay, so that's uh, in, in the yes case. I want, I, this, now I'm kind of making some kind of definition. So I, I want a proof system where if G was three colorable, there will be a proof causing the verifier to always say yes, no matter what the coin glasses were. And if G is not three colorable, I want it for every proof. Again, now I cannot talk about what the verifier is doing except with probability. I want that the fraction of coin tosses that cause the verifier to say no is non-negligible. Previously it was zero. Now it should be non-negligible or really the way we, we like to, uh, to write it is we always talk about the probability of saying yes. Now it should be less than 0.99. Okay, and hint is it's the same 0.99 as before. Uh, so let's let's see why. Um, okay, so let me just say so. What is the so so far? I described this Irit, kind of. A, uh, sorry, yes. I think I think there's a question that it might be worth answering live just to clarify for everyone. So, anonymous attendee asks: Is the proof a general algorithm or a string relative to a specific G? Is the proof so the proof has an existential uh, quantifier and then uh, uh, for all quantifier so the, the proof you don't need to think about it as an algorithm it's uh, the prover is almighty and the proof can be anything in the like in NP the the guy that generates the coloring for you uh, can be doesn't have to work in any kind of bounded uh, computational time I'm not maybe I'm not sure if I understood but, I the mean, question. I think maybe it's it's good to say that there's a protocol that both the prover and the verifier are going to follow, but they can handle that protocol applies to any input. But the prover's protocol doesn't have to be efficient. Right, sure. Okay, ho ho sorry, hopefully this maybe is it'll be clear in a minute. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, I, I know this medium is tricky and it, uh, I'm sorry that I, I'm not able to answer more uh, immediately, but anyway, thanks for, thanks for asking and please, please do ask any clarification. I, I'll try to understand the question better. Uh, let me just say this. Right now, I was just describing like a story. Uh, there's a prover, there's a proof, the guy is reading the input and there's his tossing coin. So uh, the quantifiers uh, are a bit uh, hard to digest in, in the first go. So let me now repeat it and try to be a bit more careful and a bit more formal, okay? So, so far I, I, in this, in this uh, square, I wrote two statements, but it's not clear who's requiring what from whom. So let me uh, now state a theorem, okay? PCP theorem, okay? And the theorem says that there is a verifier Okay, so there is a verifier algorithm for every NP problem, in particular for, for graph three coloring. Okay, so I can state the theorem for graph three coloring. Graph three coloring has a, a PCP verifier, so that means there is some algorithm for the verifier that follows steps uh, follows steps one, one point five, two, and three, and in the end. Uh, it satisfies these two uh, these two requirements. Uh, these two requirements. Okay, so the PCP theorem says this: every 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 NP language, and I don't think the term NP language is very familiar to people outside of complexity. So let me just say: think of this instead of just read this as I'm saying for the problem of three coloring, okay? So you can just think of this as three coloring or any other NP problem you like, like satisfiability, okay? Every NP language has a verifier. So this is just, think of this as just an algorithm. And, but this algorithm has the kind of interface that is drawn here in the picture. So the algorithm the input comes from here. The algorithm has access to some random point, random uh, coins, and the algorithm is reading a proof from some proof oracle. So there is a verifier such that 
okay, so I can uh, just uh, copy it again. So I just uh, copy uh, such that uh, on input, such that for every on input uh, X for, for the language, but we can think of it as a graph G. Uh, the verifier, okay, how do I do this? I tried to be very sophisticated. Yeah, the verifier reads the input. So in our case, it's maybe the graph G. Then it tosses some random bits, log in if N is the size of G. And then uh, it reads a very small part of the proof. So now I can actually even specify. It reads uh, O of one proof locations. So that's kind of shockingly reads a very tiny part of the proof, right? Usually you expect to have to read the entire three coloring. No, this verifier is only gonna read actually very few bits. And then it can, it outputs yes or no. And the, so, so far I'm just saying every, three, every NP language or in particular three coloring has this kind of algorithm. And what does the algorithm satisfy? It satisfies this, uh, these two conditions. Ah. These two conditions, which is that if the input, so the verifier uh, doesn't know. I mean, the verifier gets the graph G. As we said before, this is an NP complete problem. Uh, it can be something or it can be three coloring. So it gets the graph G. The verifier doesn't know and has no way of knowing if it's a three colorable graph or not. Nevertheless, um, with the help of the proof, it can uh, read only a tiny part of the proof and decide if to say yes or no. And it, it, it has this very different behavior in both cases. So now it's important, the questions that I was asked, the 0.99 here is fixed for this, uh, for this theorem. It doesn't have to do with the size of the graph G. This is for every graph G and the 0.99 is fixed once and for all. Maybe I should have a 0.999, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, okay, so now what, what, would this, uh, what would this verifier be? It is simply, uh, the, the, the kind of very simple algorithm which does the following. You read the graph G, you toss some random coins and based on them, you decide to choose an edge at random. So that you use the random coins to just select which edge to read. Okay, and then you select an edge, say U1, U2. You look at the proof locations corresponding to U1 and U2 and you read the colors there. If the colors are different, then it looks like a good proof. So you say yes. And if the colors are the same, ah, you found that someone is trying to cheat you and you say no. So this is the PCP verifier, except that there is a problem with this PCP verifier. So I would say that this is a naive, a naive PCP verifier. They choose a random edge. Except if endpoints, maybe I should write read, read colors from proof. And accept if distinct, if, if the colors are different. So this is an naive PCP verifier and it would work on graphs that are not of the type that the example I gave in the beginning, uh, graphs that are not brittle, graphs where if they are three colorable, fine, there is a three coloring, there's no problem. But if they are not three colorable, I don't want them to have these colorings that are very misleading, that look like almost all the edges are happy except for one edge that is unhappy. These graphs are actually problematic because for such a graph, the probability for such a graph, if the prover was devious and gave me this kind of coloring, then the probability that the verifier will see a problem is only one out of the E edges. So the, the probability here will not be 0.999, it would be uh, as bad as one minus one over E. 
that's kind of the worst possible that the proof is very misleading there's only one edge that the verifier will catch and every on then every on every other edge the verifier will say yes only say no on one edge out of all of the edges so one minus one over e when e is the size of the graph it, uh, this goes almost to one whereas in my in the theorem i'm saying that the probability is bounded by some constant uh, fraction okay so how do i uh fix this instead of uh, running the naive uh, verifier on the initial graph we first go back to where we were in the beginning and we first run the pcp mapping on our graph to get a new graph g tilde that we know is not brittle remember that we had this transformation if i scroll up we had this transformation and this algorithm here i am over here that takes a graph G into a new graph G tilde. And in the new graph, I'm guaranteed that if G was not recolorable, then G tilde doesn't have any problematic uh, uh, colorings. All the colorings always violate at least 1% of the edges. So what a naive verifier should do is first run the PCP transformation on G and then expect as proof, not a three coloring for G, but rather a three coloring for G tilde. Okay, so going back, uh, going back. Okay, so uh, the PCP theorem was proven in the uh, beginning of the 90s, I guess 90 or 91. Um, and uh, it immediately kind of, uh, well, ha had many different uh, consequences, but uh, one thing was, uh, it was very shocking to think about this, that uh, a proof for three colorability or for any other NP problem can be verified by reading only a constant number of bits, kind of very counterintuitive. So this was one aspect that was quite uh, incredible. And another aspect is that this is very much related to hardness of approximation, which is what I want to describe uh, Describe now. So maybe before I move on, let me just pause for a minute to see if there are any more questions. Can you see the questions that were asked? Because there were a lot of them, but many of them have already been, or all of them have already been answered in the chat. Oh, okay. I cannot see anything. Unfortunately, I had some Wi Fi problems and I cannot. Uh, okay. I'm only seeing my iPad screen. Yeah. Okay. So I guess the, the, the protocol okay, that we're taking with questions is if, if one of the panelists wants to answer it live, then they will then they will interrupt you and otherwise we'll answer them. Cool. Okay? All right. Cool. So let me so risking uh, repeating answers that were given in the chat. Uh, let me just mention a, a couple of things here. Uh, there are some parameters that are natural to consider for the verifier. So let me talk about them before I move to hardness of approximation. And that will be probably uh, the end of today's lecture. Um, parameters of the verifier. So uh, one thing is the number of uh, queries to the proof. So we said that in the PCP theorem, the verifier reads a constant number of uh, symbols from the proof, but what is this constant? Okay, so that's one parameter. Uh, another parameter is the alphabet of the proof. So alphabet in the sense of coding theory, it's maybe the most basic is to think of the proof as written in bits, but for example, in three coloring, it's natural to write the proof in the alphabet of way zero, one, two. And uh, in other cases, it's natural to go to an even larger alphabet because it allows other parameters to become better. And we'll see this now. Uh, a third parameter, uh, okay, we'll see this soon, but first let me talk about the number of random coins. The number of random bits used by the verifier. So we said O of log N, but actually 
uh, as long as it's O of log N, this corresponds to a polynomial uh, size transformation. But of course, if it's one times log N, this will be a linear transformation. That's uh, one uh, thread of uh, research is trying to get this uh, to be as efficient as possible. Uh, okay, I won't say any more about this today. Um, uh, final parameters are the completeness and soundness. So completeness, these are the two probabilities. The completeness and soundness are these two probabilities over here. Completeness is the probability of saying yes when you're supposed to say yes. Okay, so let's just only treat the case right now that it's one. Often it's close to one, like one minus epsilon. Uh, sometimes it's other values. And the soundness is the probability to say yes when you're supposed to say no. If the graph is not recolorable, really what you want the verifier is to always say no. But okay, this cannot be done. So you measure the soundness. What is the probability of saying yes falsely? And here we wrote the soundness to be 0.999. So okay, that's one PCP verifier and it has soundness of 0.999. You might ask, okay, but I want to know what is the best possible soundness that I can guarantee? Can I get 0.998 and so on? So that's the completeness and soundness. And we often care about uh, trying to understand the trade-offs between these various parameters. Okay. So now let me move to talk about hardness of approximation. Okay. So in general, when we think about approximation, we should first talk about optimization problems. In optimization problem, you're trying to find the best solution. The solution say for three coloring, I should think about max three call. I prefer to give an example and talk about it than to give a generic definition. So I'm sticking to this example. Max three call in this case will be the problem of given a graph, find the coloring of the vertices that maximizes the fraction of edges that are bichromatic. And that's a maximization problem. Uh, you, you can think of others, for example, given a system of equations, find an assignment to the variables that maximizes the fraction of satisfied equations. All of these are very similar. And again, like I said in the beginning, there are examples of the constraint satisfaction problems. Okay, so we already know that this optimization problem is NP-hard because we know that it's hard NP-hard to decide if the value, if you can satisfy 100% of the edge constraints or less than 100%. So we know it's NP-hard uh, for this case. Okay, you can think about max three lin. So max three lin is the problem of, you have a bunch of linear equations over the field of two elements, zero and one, and maybe each equation only has three variables. So they're very simple equations. And still, uh, your task is to find an assignment that satisfies the largest fraction of equations. In this case, unlike the three coloring case, to decide if the whole system is satisfiable or not, it's very easy. It's, you just need to invert the matrix. Um, but the optimization problem to find the maximal uh, solution maximizing the fraction of good equations, actually this is NP hard and the reason is that the equations can be overdetermined. It can be the case that there is no solution to all the equations. And then these algorithms like Gaussian elimination, they just fail. And it turns out that this is NP hard to uh, maximize. And there, almost every CSP you think about is uh, NP hard to, max, to, uh, to optimize over. And so it's natural to think about approximation algorithms, which is an algorithm that uh, is supposed to give you a weaker guarantee. Okay, it won't find the maximal solution, but it will find a solution that maybe is guaranteed to be within 98% of the maximum. Okay, so that's an approximation algorithm. And the PCP theorem says that even 
approximation is NP hard for these kinds of uh, constraint satisfaction problems. So the PCP theorem implies that uh, even, even, sorry about this, So here I'm just going to give as an example max three call. And the reason is, as we sign the PCP theorem, it's going to be NP hard to decide if a graph is perfectly three colorable or if uh, the, the maximal fraction is no more than 0.99. We already know. It's NP hard to decide between a, the value of G is one or the value of G is less than 0.99. In here, the, the value is this, is the maximal fraction of satisfied edges. When I say satisfied, I mean bichromatic. So this was one formulation of the PCP theorem that these two things, it's NP hard to tell between them. And so if I had an approximation algorithm that approximates to within 0.999, I would give this algorithm the graph G and it would give me uh, some value that's within a small margin of error, which would allow me to distinguish between these two cases. So such a statement actually proves to me hardness of a, or the non-existence of approximation algorithms, assuming P is different from NP. So these are always, all these uh, hardness uh, statements are always assuming that uh, of course that P is different from NP. Okay, and now we get to this uh, value of 0.99, okay? And uh, okay, actually, so I'm gonna end in 10 minutes and I want to leave few minutes at the end to, to give a, a roadmap to the talks that will come. So, okay, and actually I'm, I'm doing pretty good on time. So I will finish this in a few minutes and then I will talk about what's, what will be in the next few talks. Um, okay, so now I'm getting to the parameter 0.99 and how it relates. Uh, it doesn't relate to the specific G, but it does relate to the specific, oops, problem at hand, max three pal. Okay, so if, if instead of max three coloring, I would have here a different problem, for example, uh, maximizing linear equations, you could expect that this number might be different, and it is. And here is a, a very celebrated theorem of Johan Hastad, uh, which says uh, actually, for some uh, specific problems like three sat and three lin. I know the exact constant that needs to be here. So not I know, but Hastad knows. So um, for three lean and similarly for three sat uh, has no uh, non-trivial approximation algorithm. Okay, so I won't have time too much to go into it. We will talk about it probably in the last lecture, but uh, for example, for three lean, you have a bunch of linear equations over Boolean variables. It's very easy to see that you can always satisfy half the equations. If some assignment uh, satisfied less than half, then just flipping all the bits uh, will satisfy more than half, something like that. Uh, what I said is not completely correct, but it's actually very easy to see. Maybe you, you, you can do a probabilistic argument to say that in expectation, each equation is satisfied with probability half. So there must be an, uh, an assignment that satisfies more than half of the equations. So it's always very easy to satisfy half of the equations. And what has to be proved is that, um, okay, let me actually just erase three sets for now. And what has to be proved uh, is that actually it is NP hard to decide if the value of the equations, the, the given system of equations is above one minus epsilon 
or if the value is at most half plus epsilon. And this is for every epsilon. Okay, so uh, you're given a system of uh, Boolean equations with each equation with three variables. And, uh, and it's hard to tell between almost 100% and almost 50%. So in that sense, there's no non-trivial approximation algorithm. And similarly for three sat, and today we know that uh, the picture is even more uh, subtle, that it's not really just the random assignment, really the, the value that distinguishes between these two cases is the SDP value. And when I say no, this uh, is, I mean that the SDP value is the correct soundness, soundness parameter here. And when I say I know this, so uh, Prasad Raghavendra proved this assuming the unique gains conjecture. So we still don't know this for a fact, but uh, it's conjectured that we know the correct value uh, up, to this, uh, up to this open question. Okay, so let me, uh, let me just summarize what I said about the uh, hardness of approximation. I just said that the PCP theorem uh, in, in its uh, standard form is equivalent to some statement about the hardness of approximation, for example, of three coloring, but you can run it also on other problems like on three lean or on three sat, many other uh, NP problems. You, you can interpret the PCP theorem as a statement about hardness of approximation. You will get some parameter, like here we got this 0.99. I, I kind of just made it up. From the theorem, you will get some worse constant, like 0.99999. And then I said that Hasted proved a much stronger PCP theorem. We call it, it's a tight, it's a tight PCP theorem. It's tight because the, the parameter that, that he got is, is the best possible. There's an algorithm showing you cannot do more than, you cannot do better than that. And so we know for some problems that what is the exact tight uh, parameter? And there's a huge uh, amount of work on this. Uh, and when you try to look at uh, tight parameters, you encounter many geometrical questions. And this will be described in the next, uh, maybe this will be described actually in the last lecture on Monday. So uh, now let me finish by giving you a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going with this uh, sequence of talks. So the way I wanted to say it is to ask how uh, are the theorems, the PCP theorem and Hastad's theorem proven? Okay, and, and even further theorems, right? So tomorrow on, on lecture two, Dana will, will talk. She will give a, a proof of a basic PCP theorem. It's even, it's weaker than the, the, the PCP theorem that I mentioned here. This is what we call the, the, the basic PCP theorem. Dana will give a proof of a, a, weak, a weak PCP theorem. I mean, there's so much you can expect her to prove in one hour. So this would already be quite an accomplishment. Okay. Then in lecture uh, three, I will talk about kind of a, how to prove how to prove a, a stronger PCP theorem a, using a kind of a tensor tensor operation, which we call parallel repetition. So I will talk about this operation, which takes one PCP theorem and maybe strengthens it. And this is important, both because there are some very interesting geometrical questions, high dimensional geometric questions here that we thought might be interesting to tell you about, but also because this is a kind of initial step towards uh, proving Hastad's results because he uses this kind of uh, theorem combined with uh, something called the long code gadget, which will be a uh, key player in the last lecture where uh, Dana will talk about a uh, unique games conjecture and the long code and uh, all kinds of isoparametric uh, questions. 
that arise when you try to prove a hardness of approximation. So when you try to prove tight hardness of approximation, like in Hasted's theorem, but in a more general and more applicable, applicable to more like problems, then you reach all of these interesting questions and that will be the last lecture. So stay tuned. Okay, so uh, thanks Irit for the great lecture. And uh, so Jesse has just uh, put a link in the chat to the Discord channel, so we can all go on to Discord now. And uh, maybe after a break for stretching and or coffee or tea, uh, we can discuss what we'd like. And then uh, we'll reconvene later for Ramon's talk.